The A can is not happy. 85 to 90 par right here. There's a documentary coming out. It's called The Dark Hobby. And out of curiosity, I was just looking at my tank through these glasses. Let's stack these guys right here. Alright, this is really gonna be for my own documentation. I bumped up the Radeon G5 by 1%, and usually that is the breaking points for the ACAN on Michael Musa's right here. I need to double check the actual level I'm at, but like usually there's this one breaking point where if I'm 1% power over, the ACAN looks kind of like this. It's all shrunken up for the next day. I never push past it. Whenever I see the ACAN like this, I just dial it back 1% and then it's open up all fluffy, happy again. I really wanna start dialing the light up a little bit for this tank uh, because I feel like these corals can really benefit with just a little bit more light and I really want to step it up for the SPS as well. So with that in mind and seeing how this A can is encrusted over the rock so it's not a colony I can just kind of pick off or pop off the rock and relocate. It is there to stay. I'm slowly slowly walking up the lights. I'm really happy to see the Philly is doing well even with the uh, increased lights. Ganipora is doing well. Ganiporas, Zoas, uh, frog spawn. Look at this noodle, golden noodle. Look at this. Check out the um, rainbow infusion soas. That's one of the reasons why I want to dial up the light because they're kind of uh, standing up a little bit, reaching for the light. So I figured I could use a little bit more lights. Typically, when the light is stronger, the corals get a little bit more vibrant, uh, at least for most corals. So that's also one of the reasons, uh, besides for the SPS, that I want to kind of like dial the light up uh, just a tiny hint. And again, there's not a drastic change, uh, just by 1%. And that is uh, usually where the breaking point is for this Micromusa or Aiken Lord, as we, uh, at least alive. I like to call it still old habit dies hard. Alright guys, I haven't pulled out my par meter in quite a while, but I just want to get a reading and see how much par we're dealing with at this spot right here. Alright, so it looks to be about 90 par or so right here. I'm gonna give it a couple days, see how that A can does, and then we're gonna take some par reading around the tank just to see uh, what we're dealing with here. The next day. Alright guys, so the A can is not happy with the 1% uh, increase. Now, as a result, I dialed it back down 2% just so that we kind of give it a little breathing room and uh, let it kind of chill a little bit. It's probably gonna be pissed off for a day or two before it returns back to normal. It should puff up again like this. Um, there's no skin loss, so that is good but it's definitely not happy. It's kind of a tough situation because I feel like I could potentially keep trying to acclimate this uh, Aiken Lord, uh, but the problem is with the Radeon lights, even 1% is too much. I cannot do a 0.5% increase. So I don't know, man. Um, I may just have to stick with like 38%. Meanwhile, while I'm down here, I was playing around with the uh, UV glasses that has been really popular in the hobby uh, the past two or three years. For myself, the first time I saw UV glasses like this was from the very first Aquachella in Chicago. <laughs> To be honest, I never paid too much attention to this, um, except at shows sometimes once in a while when they pass these out, I'll put it on, I'll look at it and be like, oh my God, this looks absolutely amazing. But I never really wear this uh, at home to look at my own corals. Steadily over the years, these UV glasses have been making more and more of an appearance at shows and giveaways and stuff like that. And this pair in my hands actually came from Joker corals in Georgia. I did a video on them last week. And out of curiosity, I was just looking at my tank through these glasses and man, it looks good. And I didn't even crank the blue light all the way up on these radions here. So just out of curiosity, I'm gonna compare how the tank looks under my normal orange filter. This is a Tiffon orange filter. Uh, I think it's, it does a decent job knocking out the blue while keeping the color true. So really non-scientifically, first I'm gonna take off the Tiffon's orange filter. The camera is currently on manual white balance of 5200K. I don't know why I keep pointing here because you obviously cannot see these uh, values. I see it on the camera. Uh, but right now, let's put on this glasses right here. Oh man, look at this. This is definitely stronger than the orange filter I was using. It gives the coral a nice pop. You know what would be fun to do? Later on, I should totally just put on all the blue channel of the Radeon Pro and see how it looks under uh, the UV glasses as well as the orange filter. I, I bet you everything is gonna glow amazingly. So this is with the UV glasses. Wow, okay. It does look good. It really looks good. Thing just seems to shine, look at this. All right, for comparison, let's step on 
the uh, Tiffon orange filter. All right, this is much more muted. Although I feel like this is more true to what I see. Actually, it's really true to what I see since I tuned it. Um, when I film, I always use this uh, 5200 Kelvin, uh, uh, working with the uh, set spectrum. Because I really want a consistent look uh, throughout all my videos, I make sure the radion only comes on on a specific spectrum. So there's no ramping of like color changing, uh, which is something that I kind of miss, but for the sake of like easier filming and stuff like that, everything's set. So for my camera, 5200 Kelvin pair with this Tefan's uh, orange filter works perfectly, but you know, out of curiosity, it's double. Let's, let's stack these guys right here. Right, that's, that's, dude, that's way orange. Yeah, this does not work. I thought it would give some nice pop, but uh, no, it's just really, really orange. All right, later on in this video, I think what I'll do is uh, just make this light really, really blue and just compare the two and see how things pop. Yeah, so not too much has happened to the tank this week, so I'm just doing random stuff around the tank to keep myself from sticking my hand into the tank all the time. Seems to be working. Moments later. By the way, it seems to be turning into one of my slogan, but I haven't mentioned it recently. Can you guys guess what it is? Yep, that's it. Dude, look at this. My hippo tank has gotten really, really large. My gosh, look at that. This is a span of what, like nine months at this point? That guy is like four inch now. That is ridiculous. It's gotta be like the seaweed I'm feeding it or something. Ridiculous. And look at this little yellow line goby. He's turning into quite a chubby little guy, but really, really friendly. This guy's always out and about. Same deal with the neon goby. That guy is always out and about and always resting on a clam. May the clam rest in peace. And also check out the envious. Usually they are out and about. And of course, when I have my camera out, they're all of a sudden camera shy. Let's see if they come over here. Here comes the ladies. How about the men? Oh, by the way, you see red stuff floating around and those are the uh, red seaweed I just put in. And the yellow tang and hippo tang absolutely tear that things up. And look at the uh, flasher rest. I still don't know for sure what kind of rest this is, but based on name, it looks like one of those, uh, the orange fin flasher rest. I mean, it's a pretty generic name, but somebody suggested it. Maybe it's just pulling my legs. Oh, here, here they are. Look at the uh, Larry Tail Amphius. Check these out. The male has uh, almost completed his transition to a male. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, the females, amphias, can transition to a male. Uh, the, almost kind of like the clownfish, except in reverse, the dominant female transform into a uh, male. And that's that guy right there. Looks gorgeous, right? I feel like photos and video doesn't really do this guy justice, but when you see them in person, it's like a different vibe and different texture. And I believe his uh, dorsal fin is gonna get even longer. Uh, it's gonna do beautiful, beautiful fish. Initially, I was a little bit worried because I feel like I probably want one or two more females to uh, disperse the aggression from the male. But honestly, it's not too bad. I was thinking about maybe getting uh, one more light tail amphias or two or three other type of amphias. I was really looking at the Ivansis. Um, but then I took a step back and I looked at the tank and I realized a lot of my fish are in the uh, red and orange color spectrum. Just look at all these guys. Uh, so that's when I realized that, you know what, I have too many orange fish. Ideally, I'll get some of uh, maybe like blue or green fish. So I was thinking about green chromis, uh, the green chromis axle. I think that type is a little bit easier to keep. Um, and live aquaria do sell the different types. Uh, one is the kind of like quote unquote run of the mill, more common green chromis. And the other ones is the, uh, the axles, I believe. And they seems a little bit hardier and the color is a little bit more powdery, if that makes sense, not as shiny. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, but again, green chromis, they do get big. So I'm still kind of debating. Besides chromis, I was also thinking about the uh, thread fin, a blue eyed cardinal fish. LFS actually brought a batch in for me and QT them. Unfortunately, only one of them made it through QT. And the second batch, when it's almost ready to go, I was going through this crazy nutrient issue in my tank, so I was not ready to receive them. And after that point, right now my nitrate is slightly elevated, so I feel like it's probably not the best time to introduce a big group of fish. So I kind of like, okay, gotta keep it on a back burner. We'll see what happens in the future. And speaking of fish, kind of like a sad news because I haven't seen the pearly jawfish in a hot minute. We can have to be exact. I've seen him dis disappear for maybe like a day or two at a time, but he'll always show up, but not this time. So I'm not sure. I'll do a uh, careful check of the overflow, back overflow. I did not see him in the refugium, in the sump, or like around the tank. No, actually, I should check again. Yeah, I don't see him behind the tank or anything like that. I don't expect him to be, um, simply because I have this mesh top. 
that's uh, sealed pretty tight. So I feel like it's, it's pretty secure inside. So I don't know, man. I mean, it was eating well and dude just kind of disappeared. So it's, it's a strange one. Maybe it went into the uh, rolls of the enemy or ran into the pistol shrimp. I'm not sure, but um, crossing my fingers, crossing my fingers. A while back, I got the circus goby as well, or the black bar goby. And that guy just straight up disappeared after I added him to a tank uh, many months ago. And I I just assumed the worst. Then again, I've had fish like uh, two of those high fin goby disappear for three weeks and all of a sudden they disappeared. Same thing with that little white line goby disappeared for almost a month and a half, two months. And one day he just disappeared and started staying out. So I'm still kind of holding a sliver of uh, hope for the circus goby as well as the jawfish. One day they may surprise surprise me and pop up. Uh, not so much a jawfish because I feel like they're more in your face and personable. If they're around, usually they make themselves to be known. Versus the uh, circus goby, I've never kept one. I don't know what they're like. So I feel, and I heard that they're really cryptic. So maybe it'll still pop up one day to say hi. Um, still holding out hope, so we'll see. But for now, I guess we'll just enjoy the fish that's uh, happy to show the face and share the, the regular life with us. Uh. Speaking of fish, by the way, recently I heard the buzz that the uh, there's a documentary coming out. It's called The Dark Hobby. And it was done by, I believe, Snorkel Bob. And he is this hardcore conservationist. Fundamentally, I do believe that this hobby is selfish by nature. I mean, there's no way around it. You can't sugarcoat, like, catching things from nature or even captive breeding things in nature just to kind of keep them for our own, our own like uh, enjoyment. I mean, this is not for food, this is for enjoyment, right? It's not 100% necessary. So that's no sugarcoating it, I think. So it's a matter of like, what can each of us accept ourselves? I mean, if we keep birds in cage, we keep like dogs and cats indoor, you can argue that they were bred that way or they be involved that way. So we have a symbiotic relationship with each other. But then again, Ah, fish is a little bit different story. I mean, I've come to accept it, but I'm really interested to see uh, the argument that documentary bring to the table. And I know people, some people are probably kicking me right now, be like, yo, why are you bring more attention to that potential documentary that's coming out? Personally, I would like to learn more about it. If this hobby really has some serious issue going on, I'd rather know about it and then decide myself whether I could live with it or not versus like just kind of like burying my head into the sand and pretend everything is, uh, is nice because like, look, the meats that we eat on the table came from a living animal as well. So I feel like it is good and responsible to know uh, where our animals come from. And hey, if there's a music that we gotta face, then let's face the music and we'll see where we go from there. All right guys, that was kind of heavy, kind of random and um, kind of interesting because yellow tang is kind of at the center of a lot of these things. So, dude. The next day. Yep guys, and that was it. Aiken Lord on Mikomusa is completely open now, now that we dialed the light intensity down to 35% actually. I decided to go a little bit lower just so that uh, it, the coral got a little breathing room. And once the coral get a couple days of rest, we're gonna slowly acclimate it up. This time I'm gonna use the Mobius acclimation mode so that it's a more gentle step versus like 1% each time. We can break it up further. But uh, before we move on, let me do a really quick par value reading uh, around the tank. For par reading, we're gonna use the tried and true Apogee. This is the MQ510, which is adjusted to the blue spectrum or blue LED. It's gonna be kind of tricky to do this by myself, but it is what it is. Um, all right, so right by the A can, area of interest, we are looking at 85, I'll say like average 85 par. It's, it's gonna bounce around a little bit due to the water surface agitation, so it's never gonna sit still. So just that difference of 10 par causes the uh, A can lord to completely close up and all pissed off. All right, we're gonna move to the SPS section. I'm gonna talk a little funny because I got the camera clamped under my armpits and it hurts my chest. All right, we're looking at 135 par right here. Slightly higher, we're looking at 145. Wow, it steps up really quickly. Back here, where the SPS is doing really well, it's only 110 par, surprisingly. Next, we're gonna look at the top of the Zoe Garden. We're actually getting about 110 par right here. Surprising, I thought it would be less. Coming down to where the Ghani is, it looks like it's also about 100 par right here. We're sliding over here towards this Ghani Pora, looks like it's about, nah, or also about 100 par, surprisingly. Goat Noodle or Goat Torch, we're looking at about 85 to 90 par right here, so that's a decent amount of par. Back at the Anemone, we are looking at 
about 95 par, pretty consistent actually across the board. And going back to the Uphelia Gardens in the back, we're looking at, wow, that's really low. What, like 30 to 40 par-ish? It, it varies a lot simply because of shade. Look at the Froxman right here. It looks like it fluctuates between like 40 pars to something ridiculously low. Um, the last but not least, I want to look at the hammer right here. Hammer is about 85 par. Dude, I have to say, um, the Leica spread is actually really even for the Radeon G5. I didn't even think about it until I started getting uh, power reading from around the tank. Just for fun, let me just kind of bring this right under the light above the waterline. 650. Okay, all right. All right, guys, to be completely honest, I was not expecting such a even spread. Like, it didn't even cross my mind. I thought the number is going to be all over the place, but the number is really consistent between, like, the front portion of the tank and the back portion. And let me tell you why it's impressive. Look at this. Because if you look from the side of the tank, this is a pretty deep tank. This is 30 inches front to back. It's not like a regular uh, two-foot or 24 inches. Just having such a wide tank, and I only have the XL15. This is not even the XL30 on the sideway. This is XL15. The spread is so even on the same level, meaning the power value up front is relatively even to the uh, power value in the middle on the same level, and assuming nothing's blocking it, of course. So, I would, dude, I was impressed. It honestly did not really cross my mind until I started getting the values. I was like, hmm, oh, that's weird. A lot of them are really consistent. Now that I started talking about it, I do remember people saying that the Radeon G5s, uh, the spread is really even, it's really nice blanket of light, almost like those like T5 days. You know? Yeah, and again, this is not an ad by any means. It's it's just what it is. I mean, proof is in the pudding. Uh, you saw the power values, and I I'm impressed. I'm impressed, honestly. And while I was kind of moving around the tank, you may have noticed I have one completely bleached out SPS, and unfortunately, that is the amazing looking home record junior from joker corals last week uh the coral looks great for like three days and then it's, the skin started peeling i did a whole little story behind it um but then I'm, I'm waiting because like i have hopes that maybe just maybe it'll come back to life i've had to happen just look at that little spark of like force five digitata i thought it's completely dead came back to life same thing with that little piece right there totally bleach out came back to life so i don't know i'm crossing my fingers fat lady did not sing for that sps frag yet um, I do have some footage kind of like covering what have been happening as the skin started peeling off within like uh, a one and a half day period it's just skin just started coming off but I still see a little bit of like pile of extension at least uh, two days ago I'm not sure if it's still alive but we'll see I was often told that until you see algae started growing on the uh, skeleton uh, still a chance all right so I think we solved the uh, lighting issue for the Aiken Lord it is finally back open and uh, is happy again if I remember correctly I tried to push it above 100 par pissed off right now it's sitting at what 85 to 90 par so I got that 10 par space to slowly walk up to and um, I actually did a little bit more research in terms of Aiken Lord and to be honest up to this point I never really read up too much about the uh, Aiken Lord or Microbusas now uh, simply because they're one of those like really hardy corals that I've never really had any big issue with uh, unless I got like a big elk swing that'll take them out and I came across a thing Tidal Gardens um, coral care series and he talks specifically about different type of corals and uh, in particular I was looking at the Aiken ones and it has been super super helpful. One thing that jumped out to me is that Fang mentioned that in terms of light requirements Aiken really doesn't need a lot of light. They really, they're really happy between like 25 to 50 pars and sometimes people can push it but usually they like that range. I was like oh okay so that really rings a bell. I was like that makes sense. That kind of aligns with what I noticed. Although I did not realize they need that little light. Uh, 50 par, that's crazy. Usually I think like we strive for what, like 100 pars on the sand bed, which I'm pushing towards. So there you go, that was the problem. Light was a little bit too strong, as I mentioned, and once I dialed the light back, the effect is immediate. It just immediately came back out, that was it. So we'll give the A-cans maybe like two days break, and now use the Mobius acclimation mode in the span of like three to four weeks to ramp the light up to 39%, and then we'll see how it goes. All right guys, so not too much has happened this week, and I am not one to stretch out a video to hit a certain time limit. With that said, I hope you guys still enjoy this video. It is a little bit more free form and not as structured, but I hope you guys don't mind. If you did not mind, and you may actually prefer this kind of like a random rambling kind of video be sure to leave a like leave a comment let me know and i'll see you guys next sunday at 12 30 p.m sharp oh, oh, oh.